Senator from Vermont. President, I ask unanimous consent that I and Senator Cornyn be able to complete our remarks prior to the vote. Without objection. Thank you. Mr. President, I just want my colleagues to know that the Senate Appropriations Committee yesterday released nine appropriations bills. <clears throat> they allocate important resources. They help to address the pressing priorities of America's families and communities, but they also promote U.S. national security. For more than a decade, this country has underinvested in our children, in our infrastructure, in science, in public health. Frankly, that means we underinvested in our future. These bills include historic increases to educate our nation's children, to combat climate change, promote affordable housing, and improve health care. I'm proud of the work of the committee in producing these bills, and I commend each of the subcommittee chairs for their commitment to America's future. Now, the bills comply with the top-line spending allocation contained in the fiscal year 2022 budget resolution that was passed by both the House and the Senate earlier this year. So you combine this with the three bills reported from the Appropriations Committee in August, the bills provide a 13 percent increase for non-defense discretionary programs and a 5 percent increase for defense programs compared with what fiscal year 2021 enacted. <clears throat> The 5% uh, increase for defense program, that's consistent with the National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA, which was reported by the Senate Armed Services Committee on an overwhelmingly bipartisan vote, and it passed the House last month again with overwhelming bipartisan support. The Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Bill makes long overdue investments to help care for and educate our nation's children, including doubling the funding for Title I-A grants to local educational agencies. That program I mentioned is the foundation of federal support to schools across this country. It also increases funding for the Child Care Development Block Grant by 23% and head start by 11 percent. We do this to provide high quality child care and education to working families across the nation. It provides a 24 percent increase over last year for the Centers for Disease Control. And that's done to strengthen U.S. public health infrastructure. We know we have to do that in the wake of a global pandemic that has created terrible problems in that area. The Commerce Justice Science Bill provides historic funding levels for the Department of Justice Violence Against Women Act programs. That's a 48 percent increase over the last fiscal year. It's the largest appropriation for Violence Against Women Act since its creation. The Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Bill includes significant increases to reduce homelessness, improve housing conditions, increase affordability, something that touches all 50 of our states. The Interior Bill includes significant resources to promote conservation, to preserve our nat natural infrastructure, and protect our federal lands. And we made climate change front and center when drafting these bills. And each contains new and critical funding to help combat this challenge. For example, for the first time ever, we invested $54 million in a new Climate Conservation Corps. And we provide historic increases, 46 percent over last year, for EPA's air and climate program. 
And for the first time in four years, the U.S. will contribute to the Green Climate Fund and the Clean Technology Fund, rejoining the international fight, and it has to be an international fight, against climate change. We had a global retreat with the last president. The United States is standing up again and is back in the game. But we also make historic investments in medical research. I don't know anybody who doesn't want us to always improve our medical research. It ensures that America remains on the cutting edge of advanced medical science and research. So we put a 6% increase for the National Institutes of Health and $2.4 billion to create the first ever advanced research projects agency for health. And that's because of the president's bold and promising proposal to accelerate the pace of breakthroughs in medicine. And finally, the bills contain critical funding increases for mental and behavioral health services and to combat substance abuse, something that is a problem in every single state. These funds are desperately needed as we see the rates of anxiety and depression soar during the COVID-19 pandemic. And drug overdose deaths are expected to reach their highest levels to date. Now, these are just some of the highlights of the important programs funded in the nine bills we released yesterday. They'll make a real difference in the lives of millions of Americans, especially after the tough year and a half we faced with COVID-19. These bills demonstrate the good work we could do with a top line in the fiscal year 2022 budget resolution, which was passed by the Senate and the House earlier this year. I wish we could have followed regular order and done these bills in committee. But our Republican colleagues said they would prevent any additional consideration of bills until we have a negotiated top line. But in, I, I cannot, I will not allow that to stop our work. It'd be irresponsible. We need to move the ball forward. In posting these bills, we show the American people what we're for. Now, some on the other side of the aisle may characterize these bills as partisan. That's simply not true. In a spirit of comedy and bipartisanship, which is the tradition of our Appropriations Committee, we hard, worked hard to accommodate the funding priorities of all members, both Democrats and Republicans. And the posted bills reflect that effort with many, many, many of the priorities of Republicans and many of the priorities of Democrats. I'm proud of the work of this committee in producing these bills, but our job is not done. The federal government is existing under a, and operating under a continuing resolution, but only until December 3rd. Time can go by very quickly around here. Between now and then, it's imperative that we make process, progress on negotiating a top line, one that's bipartisan and bicameral, so we can enact these bills into law. I think we struck the right balance with the bills we pr produced and made public this week. As with everything in Congress, we rarely end where we begin. So I look forward to working with Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Granger, Vice Chairman Shelby, to move this process forward with the goal of enacting all 12 bills by December 3rd. If we fail to do that, then we face a long-term continuing resolution, which would lock in outdated spending priorities that will not serve the American people, and will not meet the challenges of today, and unfortunately, will not contain those things that both Republicans and Democrats have asked and which have been included in the bills that we have put in. And Mr. President, I know that my friend and colleague from Texas is waiting to speak, so I will yield the floor.